Hi, Anthony. We will discuss coloration and the Impala in our part three of the Impala podcast. Looking forward to it. Yes, well, coloration, adaptive coloration in animals, um, it's a challenging topic in many ways. And you could say that it's kind of defied the scientific method. You know, there's very little peer reviewed literature on adaptive coloration in, um, in mammals. Um, including antelopes, partly because it sort of doesn't really um, um, allow statistical analysis and and the kind of objectivity that scientists love to um, to uh, espouse. You know, um, it's a kind of a blend between science and art, and it's also true that you can't really interpret the coloration of animals without a certain amount of subjectivity. Uh, furthermore. What we humans see with our trichromatic vision is not the relevant image in the eyes of uh, an impala itself or of its carnivores, which have essentially black and white vision. I mean, technically, they can see blue and yellow, but that's really irrelevant because from the point of view of the plains game and the attendant carnivores, non-human uh, predators, all that matters is how dark or pale something is. And so... In order to evaluate the um, adaptive coloration of impalas, you need a lot of framing. You need to frame it contextually. It involves scaling because something that is conspicuous at a certain distance is not at a, at a different distance. It involves a night-day aspect, which is difficult and, and a bit mind-boggling. Mm. And it involves, um, it involves a kind of a subjective assessment of, of what is most important. Because the, mm. the coloration of an impala is immensely complex. I mean, it also defies just um, it, it defies prosaic description. Like if you look at all the, the descriptions of impalas that have ever been written down, you'll find them really woefully poor in terms of how they describe the coloration, just in terms of body parts. Yeah. Like on the, on the buttock, somebody will refer to it as the thigh. Another one will refer to, refer to it as the rump and even just. You know, we haven't even been able to get our story straight in terms of labeling body parts, let alone what the pattern of coloration is. So, yeah. Um, and are yeah. you saying that there are always trade offs in coloration then? Uh, you know, different predators are going to see the animal in a different way, and distance affects how the animal gets seen. So, there's no the ideal coloration ha, has pros and cons. The optimal coloration that natural selection ultimately uh, results in has both pros and cons. Would you agree with that? Yes, I would agree with that. But I wouldn't. I wouldn't over. I wouldn't overstress the the um, difference between different um, carnivore species. All, all of the carnivore species that are relevant to the impala, including the cats. And the yeah. dog family, the hyenas, they're all basically much of a much less. They, they've all got basically um, black and white vision. You know, okay. I'm exaggerating, but essentially not not color vision like a human. And they're all extremely motion sensitive. Some more than others. The, the spotted hyena is particularly motion sensitive. And the impala itself in its social interactions with its own species, um, you know, in which adaptive coloration also plays a part, is extremely motion sensitive. So these animals have three different visual emphases from humans that are really relevant before you even begin to interpret their adaptive coloration. Number one is they don't see color. And so when you look at the impala, you've got to take the roy out of the roy bok. The roy, the reddish <laughs> color, is completely irrelevant. You've got to look at it through a, a kind of an imaginary prism of, of black and white and gray, shades of gray. Secondly, uh -huh. um, what's important is, is motion. So any little feature, for example, um, a pattern on, on the lips, on some part of the body that moves in a significant way or on the tips of the feet can be yeah. very important adaptively because although it may be small, it tends to be accentuated by motion. And these animals are much like an order of magnitude more motion sensitive than we are. Yeah. Um, and, then, and then thirdly, half of their lives are, are led at night where who knows what the rules are because the, these animals all see better at night than we do. And so um, something that may seem anachronistic or um, you know, maladapted during the day may actually have a crucial uh, survival value at night. So 
the 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 bottom line is that um, uh, studying adaptive coloration is an exquisitely interesting thing, but it's not for everybody because it requires a really deep dive into um, a complex web of factors, plus a lot of subjectivity and also a kind of an artistic eye because you need to be able to um, factor out or screen out the irrelevancies in, in what you're looking at. Yeah, I do think humans can, in some circumstances, get an eye that's really tuned in to motion. Uh, I'm thinking of bird watchers in particular. Uh, they're able to pick up a small warbler in the top of a uh, far away an acacia tree just with the little movement of the beak or a wing flick. And um, you know, having been uh, on many birding expeditions myself, I'm very aware of how it almost becomes like a sixth sense where you're picking up that motion and that if uh, on a windy day, birding is so much harder because you, you, you know the leaves are, are moving too much and you can't pick up that little flicker of the, the bird that gives it away. So uh, I, think, I think we can start appreciating what it's like to be a, a leopard or a, a lion in the bush waiting for that telltale flick of, flick of the tail or um, slight movement of the, of the animal, yeah. Yes, well, that that is true, but but um, something that many people don't realize is that that sort of motion sensitivity in the human eye is relatively peripheral. What I mean by that is, one sees a tiny motion more out of the corner of one's eye than out of the central gaze, and that's because, yes. unlike the eyes of all of these animals we're talking about in the African bush, impala or leopard or hunting dog, we have a fovea. And we mm -hmm. share that with, for example, monkeys and baboons. And so we're very good at focusing on a particular spot, which suits our dexterity. So we can look at something with intense scrutiny. Yeah. And these animals can't do that. You know, when, you, when a domestic dog looks at you affectionately, it doesn't really see you in the way that we humans see each other because it can't focus on your face. It doesn't have an optical mechanism of focusing on a central fovea. Right. That, that, that fovea is, is also... Um, uh, associated with the color vision. So when we look at something, we see it very clearly as a central, crisply defined object that has all sorts of color differentiation. What these animals do instead is they have a broad scale vision, um, a kind of a, horizon, a horizon sweeping vision where they see tremendous detail, but they don't see it centrally. They see it peripherally. And in, okay. in our eye, in our eye, the, the greatest motion sensitivity is in the peripheral parts of the retina where the color vision is relatively poorly developed and the, um, the, the fovea, the focus, is absent. So if you, if you can imagine, like when you spot a bird, you'll usually spot it somewhere outside your central vision. Now, yeah, if you can imagine your whole, your whole eye being devoted to that and then more motion sensitive again and also yeah. less distracted by color because color is yeah. a distraction to these animals, You've got something of, and then, you know, in the case of an impala with the eyes mounted on the side of the head so they can see behind themselves as well as to the side and in front of themselves because they're monitoring a horizon rather than focusing on a thing as humans do. Yeah. Then you start to put yourself in the world of um, the, re the relevant aspects of adaptive coloration that we need to study to understand how they operate as opposed to how we see them. Yeah. It's it's astounding that a lion or leopard or hunting dog or whatever is is able to actually uh, successfully stalk these animals because given that incredible um, motion sensor of, of theirs that you would, you would think that they would spot them from a mile off and I think you were saying that um, Eland are particularly good at that uh, and, and that's how the eland managed to survive by spotting the predator from a from a mile off but impala can't do that i suppose because of the the cover that the bush cover that they um that they live within yes well that cover does does get in the way of detecting predators um but you know talking about eland nobody's really ever sorted the following out with, with respect to antelopes and deer which is they have big eyes, some bigger than others, yeah. 
Um, but it's not clear whether their big eyes are associated with seeing well in the dark or just simply seeing well in the light. And I think it depends on the species. Like, for example, you know, we all know that owls have got big eyes because they need to see in the dark. Yeah. Um, so we're familiar with, you know, big eyed tarsiers and big eyed eye eyes and, you know, all these nocturnal type creatures. Mm. When it comes to antelopes, it's not clear if any of them have big eyes to see in the dark. And, um, the reason why eland have proportionately bigger eyes than other antelopes is, I think, more to see well in the daytime. So um, they're not only seeing with the same kind of motion sensitivity as an impala, but they're seeing more with more detail at a greater distance. And it, it remains to be seen if any antelope or deer has big eyes mainly for nocturnal vision. These are these are fundamental questions, but they haven't really been studied, you know. Right. So then how should we look at the coloration of the impala? I've got one up on the screen here and it's, I think most people would say it's a pretty drab buck. Um, yeah, well, I, I don't know how to approach it in an interesting way, but I'll, I'll, I'll give the following a shot again. It may be exactly yeah. the opposite way that it should be approached, but I'll give it a shot because, again, it's anthropocentrically interesting. Now, here's, here's a, a human phenomenon that can lead us into how to look at some aspects of an impala's adaptive coloration. Most people don't realize that we humans have what I call an ocular semet. That's S-E-M-E-T. Now, an ocular semet is a pattern of coloration in the eyeball that assists communication within our species. Most people don't, don't really look at each other's eyes realizing that the eye is a phenomenon of adaptive coloration. And if you say something about adaptive coloration with respect to the human eyeball, most people think that you mean you know, blue-eyed versus green-eyed versus brown-eyed. That's not what we're talking about. Because regardless of the iris color, every human being has a contrast, a pale dark contrast, what they call in photographic terms a tonal contrast, between the white of the eye and the iris and, and, uh, and pupil. So even if you've got blue eyes, there's still enough contrast between the white of your eye and the iris plus pupil that there's a dark pale contrast there that is sharp enough that it allows human beings to track each other's gaze. Yeah. And the tracking of gaze is tremendously important in signifying emotion, where somebody is directing their attention, um, whether they're lying, eye movements, nervousness, uh, you know, the, the eyes have it as it were. And and what, what's most telling about your eyes is how your eye is moving. Now, if your eye was um, pigmented, like if you look at a chimpanzee's eye, chimpanzee is 98% human, but its eye is completely different because the, what is white in a human's eye is dark, dark pigmented with melanin in a chimpanzee's eye. Mm. And the same is true for a baboon, except in the baboon that doesn't even show the white of the eye because the eyelid is so tight. And so... We shouldn't take for granted the fact that we humans are very expressive with our eyes and we express ourselves in a way that monkeys and apes don't uh, do, largely by means of adaptive coloration. So we've got a, we've got a, uh, the fact that our, our eye whites are number one white and number two exposed by the um, arrangement of our eyelids is no accident. It's part of our adaptive coloration. And that's what I call an ocular semit. Because a mm -hmm. semit is a pattern of coloration that allows a within species, usually social um, um, uh, communication of information that's adaptively important. Wow. Okay. Does that so make there sense? are Yeah, absolutely. It's great. Looking at the impala now and wondering which pieces of it have semit. Well, okay. So now, okay, I, I, carrying on this rather abstruse and, you know, um, esoteric approach. Consider the following, that antelopes don't have the same facial expressions as we do. And so most people looking at the relatively impassive face of an impala would think, well, it doesn't have any facial expressions at all because it, nothing that we can relate to as humans. You know, they don't smile, they don't narrow their eyes in frowning or, you know, they hardly even wrinkle their nose. They seem expressionless, but they're far from expressionless. It's just that we don't uh, naturally tune into the parts of their face that are meaningful to them. Because the yeah. eyes are not meaningful. There's no ocular semit going on. There's not that kind of communication among impalas. But what they do have is very mobile ear pinnae, 
where we don't. Yeah. We've got basically just, you know, fixed ear penai which don't communicate anything um, socially or in any other way. Whereas yeah. an impala's ears are intensely mobile. They swivel around and they're also big and very brightly colored in the sense of dark tips and white fronts. And, you know, there's a, a dark uh, apical part on the back as well. Okay, yeah. so that's one part of the animal that's very expressive. And so you can imagine impalas communicating with their ears in much the same way as we communicate with our eyes. Yeah. Because there's a dark, pale contrast there that's moving around and communicating a lot. And then similarly, if you look at the mouth parts of an impala, there's a subtle, dark, pale contrast there around the lips and the well, the upper lips, the lower lips, and the chin. Yeah. And that's no accident because... The way it works with ruminants is that they are um, subject to a, a, the following problem in the anti-predator sense, and that is they spend a large part of their life chewing the cud, which is definitive of being a ruminant, and chewing the cud is a pain in the bum in many ways because it's noisy, grinding and grinding and grinding. So it's like white noise which interferes with your auditory vigilance. Um and it also happens to be very smelly because you're um, regurgitating half rotten material from, you know, the bacterial infested rumen. And, and this permeates your nostrils while you're chewing and so on. So when you start putting yourself in the in the position of an impala, you realize that one of the most vulnerable times in a ruminant's life is when it's doing what it needs to do for hours every day, which is just chew the cud. And so yeah. these animals, when they're chewing the cud, they... They usually lie down, they usually point in different directions, and they're monitoring each other. I'm hypothesizing here. I can't prove what I'm saying. It just makes sense to me. They're monitoring yeah. each other visually with, with extreme attentiveness. And what they're looking for is uh, any individual that stops chewing. Because when, 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 when uh, a predator becomes detected, yeah. some individual is going to be ahead of the others by a split second in, in getting suspicious. And the first thing that animal is going to do is to stop chewing so that the white noise ceases so it can listen up, right? Uh. And, and so as long as everybody's chewing and they're all monitoring each other and this, this um, what I call a buckle semit, this pattern of coloration around the mouth is moving uh, routinely and rhythmically in the way that it's meant to and they're, they're monitoring maybe six or seven individuals around them and they're all moving their, joys in this, their jaws in this rhythmic, um, almost like music, impala music. You know, everything is fine, you know, all <laughs> fine on the Western front. As long as, as long as the chewing carries on, the music doesn't stop. Yeah, but yeah. when one individual gets suspicious and stops chewing, everybody's attention is on that one because of the cessation of the movement. And then everybody yeah. swivels towards, swivels their ears towards the same source, turns their head, and everybody's on to that particular threat. It's hard for a human to imagine this because we're so different. But th that, that... That gives you an idea that whereas we have an ocular semit, mm. an impala has a buckle semit that is in tune with its own particular constraints um, of having to chew and yet remain vigilant at the same time. Does that make any sense? No, absolutely. And I can envisage a group of humans chatting in the bush uh, in a relaxed fashion, but we're all aware that you know, a leopard or lion could be around the next bush. If someone suddenly freezes and looks uh, in one direction, the the whole mood of the group can will change in a split second as well. We'll all start, you know, staring and uh, and we'll all freeze and stare towards where we think the leopard may be. And I guess that's yes. what the impala impalas are doing as well. Even though you can. Have a, have a very relaxed vibe, uh, you, you're a split second away from terror <laughs> when you're in the African bush. Well, that's right. That's right. Um, that's right. I mean, the, the, the direction of gaze as revealed by the human ocular semit does uh, at least partly function to, you know, alert other people to where you might be looking in, appre in apprehension. Yeah. But it's just that in the human context, that's only one tiny part of a function that's much wider uh, in a social sense. Yeah, I mean, sure. when, when you speak to somebody, you get so much information about all kinds of things from their eye movements. Yeah. And, yeah, um, yeah. signifying alarm is only a tiny part of it. 
So I quite like the mental gymnastics of imagining how an impala would view us and they would look at our ears and be just think we, we're really boring <laughs> and expressionless. Uh, look at our mouth, mouths that have a similar feeling. Um, so, yeah, they, it, it's wonderful to contemplate that impalas are communicating via their ear twitching and their, their mouth, mouths moving. So, well, that's um, right. Yeah. And it's even, you know, it's even a factor, as I mentioned before, with our closest relatives, gorillas, chimpanzees, orangutans, uh, bonobos and so on. Because when you get an eye for this, you'll notice some funny little things. Like, for example, um, you'll find a picture that's been chosen as a cover of a book about apes. Yeah. And what you, what I've noticed uh, is that the um, somebody's sneakily gone in there with Photoshop and they've actually given the animal eye whites that it didn't actually have. Because <laughs> really? Now the whole the whole point of taking a portrait of an ape is because it has a human uh, connection. Yeah. But but it must be very frustrating to photographers and to <laughs> people who publish coffee table books to find this um, you know this disappointingly unhuman like visage in the sense that everything yeah. everything is set up to look empathetic, but these black eyes just are really a downer. You know they they just <laughs> they take the whole effect out of the photograph, and so there's a tremendous temptation to just touch up the eyes a bit to make them more human. Mm. Because, you see, and this and this raises a whole uh, general theme in, in the topic of adaptive coloration, which is that adaptive coloration either withholds information or um, provides information. And when it comes to the ocular semit, to the dark pale pattern in the eyeball, human yeah. beings have an eyeball designed to give information, provide information. Sometimes it's deceptive information like lying and so on, but generally it divulges, it divulges your um, direction of attention, your wide awakeness, your interest, your emotionality, etc. It's telling, it's, it's communicating like words communicate. Whereas yeah. in most um, higher primates, including apes, the eyeball is designed to withhold communication. This is very clear in baboons. They have these beady eyes that are also shaded by eyebrow ridges. You can hardly even see the eyes. There's certainly mm. no white to see. And even in chimpanzees who have such human connection, in general, you know, there's some individual variation, but in general, the eyeballs are black. Yeah, yeah. And so you can you can be just a few feet away from a chimpanzee, and it's very difficult to read anything in those eyes because it's not giving the same white signal, sort of a Morse code, you know, that 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 the human yeah. eye is given. And that shows yeah. you how profound these differences are, because even with our own closest cousins, like the, like the bonobos, we, we differ fundamentally in our approach to ocular communication. Yeah. Chimpanzees yeah. and their kin are trying to withhold information by means of the eyes, whereas we're trying to communicate. And in baboons, it's, you know, the, the withholding of communication by means of the eyes is, is part and parcel of a whole strategy that's very different from humans because baboons teach each other nothing. They have a completely non-communicative deceptive and um how can we say they they um their whole social strategy is to withhold information a mother never teaches its kid anything nobody teaches anybody anything there's no real demonstration they hide their eyes and they they have other ways of sorting life out fascinating so natural selection pushed us towards honesty did it well, yes, it, it's it's honesty in the sense, uh, in the same sense that language is honesty, because language is a very explicit way of communicating. But at least half of the function of human language is to deceive. So yeah. you know, so when when I say provide information, it doesn't imply necessarily that the information is truthful. It just means that you're providing a lot of information. So a human can speak in 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 elaborate language with another human and use elaborate eye m movements with the ocular semit, and still half of it could be lies. Yeah. But that, that's still different from a baboon, for example, which just provides no information at all. Right. In fact, the only thing that the eyes signify in baboons is if you see if you if you see the eyes well enough through the gloom, you know, through the shade of the eye, eyebrow ridge to see that somebody's looking at you sideways, then that's a sign of aggression. It's, it's a, like yeah. a crude on off thing. Like, you know, it's the same with apes. Like if you if you go to the mountain gorillas in Rwanda, the, the guys yeah. will tell you don't look at them directly. Don't look uh, at them because that's 
they're not much interested in the nuances of your ocular summit, but if you if they catch you looking at them directly, it's just like an on-off switch for aggression because they take that as a sign that you're 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 uh, against them. You know, so do you see how the, the, the yeah. point of this is that the 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 ocular expression in apes and monkeys is is dead crude and largely negative, whereas in humans yeah. it's extremely sophisticated and elaborate, which doesn't mean to say that it's necessarily truthful. Because language in all its forms in, in the human species is about half untruthful. Language, yeah. language separates us um, from the truth as much as it provides the truth, but it still communicates something. That's our way of doing things. Mm. But isn't the exceptionally skilled human able to look at eye movement to detect lying? Yes, uh, yes, but it's not all that reliable. You know, okay. um, there are tells, there are tells, um, and it's the same with language. I mean, you can, if if you're a sophisticated user of language, you can usually tell truthful language from um, untruthful language. But yeah, it's a it's a game. It's a you know, one way of putting this is that different animals have different games. Okay. And the game in humans is different from the game in apes and monkeys, which in turn is different from the game in impalas. It's a different, it's a different gaming phenomenon. And these impalas are primed to be honest, no deception going on, I would imagine, in this uh, group vigilance. They they all united. They all incentivized to tell one another when they think there's a predator nearby. And not not perfectly. This is one of the interesting things that people have noticed about um, the common impala is that t- when two males are sparring, which they yeah. do with fervor because it's a, a seasonally seasonally rutting animal, and so you know with the hormonal charge that they have for one month in in the year in southern Africa, they're really they're really going for it, um, trying to become you know the the uh, uh, the the, uh, the animal at the high end of the hierarchy. And they've been caught out uh, deceiving each other by using an alarm snort. So what will happen is two two males will be sparring with each other and one will suddenly look to the side and give an alarm snort, which is disconcerting because it throws the other animal off its game. You know, that that um, hard wiring, that neural hard wiring to do with alarm is so profound that you can exploit it uh. to put the other one on the back foot. And it's it's even more subtle than that because one of these strange phenomena in the common impala is that um, when the when the males are uh, engaged in masculine rivalry, they have a distinctive carnivore-like roaring sound. Um, mm. More than any other antelope, you know, they're really odd that way. One of their peculiarities is that they have this almost carnivore-like roaring sound when they're in the full rut. And that's peculiar enough. But even more peculiar is that they intersperse that roaring with a snort or a sneeze that's very similar to their alarm snort or sneeze. Okay. It's really strange because they've kind of blended those two um, huh. forms of auditory communication in a way that then enables them to somewhat deceive each other. They play it up a bit and uh, they sometimes try and uh, pretend that they're alarmed. Yeah. You uh, see, so, so disconcerting for the, the rival. Yes. And- Get them out of their off their stride, as it were. That's right. So I'm I'm not pretending that impalas are anywhere near as systematically deceptive as humans are, because with humans it's almost like one of our main things is how deceptive we are with each other. Mm. You know, it's like almost a a feature, not a bug, in how to be a human is that we are profoundly um, I don't need to use the word lying, but we're profoundly, shall we say, sophisticated in our manipulation of the truth. Yeah. And um. Of course, impalas being smaller brained animals don't have that level of sophistication, but it is also true that there's a theme of deception that runs uh, through many different mammals, certainly with baboons and also to some degree with impalas. Right. And there are other uh, tonal contrasts on the impala body, um, particularly on the on the feet um, or on the lower limb. Do you think they playing a role in communication as well? Yes. Well, um, let's first describe the pattern. You know, the, the impala has very small, dainty ballerina feet. 
Yeah. It's got small hooves, no false hooves. The whole foot structure is dainty and petite and almost like a, a the tip of a stilt. But strangely yeah. enough, the pasterns, um, which are you know, which is the fur just just above the hoof itself, um, mm. is a, is a, is a, is pale. And that paleness itself is subtle and puzzling because it doesn't appear in all photographs. It's not entirely a matter of depigmentation. It's also partly a, a matter of a funny kind of a sheen effect. It's a funny kind of a sheen effect because it applies even in the shade. And I suspect mm. it applies even at night. Nobody okay. studied what, what it is about those hairs that give them this peculiar optical quality of reflecting paleness, even though um, they're not technically white hairs. But anyway, if you go through a lot of photographs of impalas, because thousands are available on the web, you'll very quick, quickly pick up that in many photographs, the pasterns, in other words, the um, almost like the, the tiny little stockings just above the hooves of the common impala are whitish. Yeah, I can see that. And um, my explanation for that would be as follows, that um, particularly in gloomy conditions, one of the ways of monitoring the whereabouts and the movements of the on specifics around you is to monitor their footfall pattern. And, um, okay. and and because the feet are moving constantly, it doesn't take a very large dark pale pattern to um, to provide quite a lot of information. So it's essentially the same phenomenon as the ocular semit in a human. I mean, the, the whites of your eyes are actually a tiny area. It's yeah. hardly square centimeter on each side of your face. Yeah. And yet it provides just reams of information. Well, similarly, yeah. this tiny little feature of the what I call the um, pedal flag mm. in the impala uh, could be providing information disproportionate to its tiny size because what the feet are doing is very important. Mm. They tell you what where the animal is. They tell you the re- direction in which it's moving. They tell you its gait and the speed of the gait. And so for an animal like an impala, which is monitoring a broad um, – spectrum uh, for movement you know it's, it's monitoring the entire horizontal sphere and it's also within that sphere it's just basically scanning for movement the whole time and so it can very easily pick up uh, where where every member of its group is at a particular moment and what it's doing with its feet and I suspect that this operates even at night when they congregate on these empty these um, these bare areas and mill around right no, there are certainly photographs here. I'm just looking on Google Images with uh, these white pastons. Uh, when you get your eye in, it looks like impalas have these short white socks on. Um, that, that's exactly right. And, you know, not every antelope has this. I mean, there are pedal flags of various sorts in other antelopes. For example, the common dacre has a nice pedal flag consisting of dark and pale. Yeah. And even an animal as familiar as, as uh, some of the species of giraffes have, have these white stockings too, very similar white stockings on a larger scale. Yeah, yeah. So uh, there are various pedal flags in various ungulates depending on, you know, with different patterns depending on the species, but many ungulates don't have any at all. Right. So, you yeah. know, they're not to be taken for granted. Sure. And then there's also a, a large dark blotch above the pastern on the hind legs so what what is that do you think that has a that plays a function of also contrasting against the the white pasterns uh well um that one is a bit more mysterious now okay so here's here's a bit of background that is a dark tuft of pillage a dark tuft of hairs around a metatarsal gland <clears throat> and that metatarsal gland which is located on the hind foot just above the fetlocks is unique to impalas. It doesn't occur in any other ungulate in the world. Uh, certainly not in the animals that seem similar to impalas, such as gazelles. And uh, the metatarsal gland has been played up a bit by authors like Jonathan Kingdon, um, who has assumed, rightly or wrongly, that it gives off a kind of a, a pheromone trail when the animal flees. Yeah. Um, either for um, mutual tracking so that members of the of the group can can kind of keep track of each other in the confusion of the explosive uh, burst of flight in alarm or maybe to send some sort of pheromonal signal to a predator now i i, I find it difficult to visualize either of these but i wouldn't con- uh, contradict 
Jonathan Kingdon because I don't have a better explanation. But suffice to say that the metatarsal gland obviously has an olfactory function. Yeah. Um, it's it's unique to impalas. Many antelopes have pedal glands in the sense of an interdigital gland. Okay. But impalas don't have that. Instead, they just have these glands uh, above the fetlock on the hind feet. And it's difficult to disagree with Jonathan Kingdon that there's probably a link between the olfactory signal given off by the metatarsal gland and the bounding habit of impalas. Because when the animal right. bounds high, you can imagine it spreading the scent from yeah. that uh, that dark tuft of hair, which it opens up. It seems to open up and, and sort of puff out um, an olfactory signal. Very mysterious and intriguing, but not well understood. And it's hard to know how we would ever really establish the facts about it. It's a difficult thing to imagine uh, um, mm. studying in a rigorous way. You know? And the f- fact that it's so dark um suggest that suggest there's also s- some communication happening um visually not just olfactory yes to some degree Factory. to some degree yeah. uh, but that even that is not particularly convincing because the fur around the metatarsal tuft is not particularly pale so you know, there's okay. not that much dark pale yeah. contrast involved but it is it is it's interesting that it is dark now yeah. for example if you go to various species of deer, they also have metatarsal uh, glands and tufts on different parts of the hind leg, closer mm. towards the hock. But for example, in the fallow deer, that tuft is, does not have a noticeable coloration. So okay. this this whole this whole aspect of the adaptive coloration of impalas, which has to do with their glands, is particularly subtle and mysterious. Mm. Uh, and the thought of these animals communicating via scent is, is is intriguing. You know, we we know that us humans communicate to some extent with pheromones, and that's a mysterious topic. Um, but you know, it's part of layman speak that that there there are pheromones that either you know that provide some signal for. The, Opposite sexes attracting one another, and, uh, and perhaps even male rivalry. Uh, but it, we don't understand it fully, and it seems like impalas might take this particular form of communication way beyond what we do. You know, there, there may be uh, these these scents emitted into the air that that the whole herd is fully aware of. It's, it's just another form of communication that we we completely blind to. What's your take on yes, that? No I, 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 no, I think that's all true. I think that's all true. But um, what's interesting about impalas specifically is that their glandular profile is so different from those of other antelopes and deer. Hmm. For example, many or most antelopes um, have got preorbital glands which are okay. conspicuously absent in impalas. Uh. Um, uh, many or most antelopes have got uh, pedal glands or interdigital glands, which are absent in impalas. Some of them have inguinal glands in the groin that are absent from impalas. Many deer have prepucial glands on the uh, foreskin of the penis, which are absent from impalas. So impalas are peculiarly um, odor-free in many ways, but they have got they've got two distinctive glandular surfaces um, one is this metatarsal gland with its associated tuft, which is uniquely placed anatomically. Mm. And the other one is a is a purely masculine gland, um, which is just the general skin on the forehead of a male impala. There's no particular um, visible gland there. It's just that that whole skin surface, which does not have distinctive coloration, but just is the forehead pelage. Okay. Yeah. That that becomes active in the rutting season, and the the male impala rubs that on bushes and so on, and spreads scent that way. So the whole olfactory profile of impalas is distinctly odd and very poorly understood. And okay. and for me, in addition to the the intrigue of sorting it out at a detailed level, what's going on? It, to me, the basic question is: uh, Are the animals trying to communicate with each other, intraspecifically, or are they trying to communicate something to predators? Because uh-huh. The latter is a definite possibility and is is more intriguing than the former. Mm-hmm. It's one thing for animals to use pheromones to communicate with each other within the species, 
and we can take that for granted to to be true to some degree. But uh, it's, it's possible that um, various ungulates, ruminants, deer, and bovids are actually communicating with their predators by releasing certain puffs of scent that are on. Uh, as part of their, as part of the yeah. starting Zahavi handicap principle. Exactly. Concept. Exactly. Because if an animal can start to demonstrate its fitness and its alertness and its togetherness, mm. and therefore mm. the, the low chances of being able to catch it, it makes yeah. sense that at least to some predators, like the ones with sharp noses, the dogs and, and so on, the, the canid predators, or the, mm. the hyenas, also got a very mm. um, good sense of smell, that, that the antelope should be communicating its hormonal fitness. Because again, right. it's an odd signal. If you've got a gland that honestly signifies your health and your yeah. fitness uh, olfactorily, mm. that could be part of the same syndrome. Mm. And uh, you know, in in the case of a white-tailed deer, for example, there is a se- series of postures and 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 movements that support that. Because when a white-tailed deer approaches a potential predator suspiciously, it it lifts and lowers its feet as if to emphasise the release of um, chemical signal from between its hooves. Oh, well. huh. The okay. impala doesn't do that, but it could still be that the metatarsal gland in the impala is there mainly to communicate with predators in some mysterious way. And I suppose the evolutionary pressure would be to have those chemicals released being difficult chemicals to manufacture, energetically expensive uh sense as it were and um the impala's signaling to the the wild dog that uh, i've got more than enough excess energy to manufacture these uh, really expensive chemicals so don't bother hunting me i can you know i've got energy to get away from you would you agree awesome. that those scents would maybe be expensive or is it more about um just effective in getting moving across the landscape probably a combination yeah uh, yes i i wouldn't i wouldn't even i wouldn't even hazard a guess anthony because i think this whole realm is so mysterious still Mm. um olfactory communication is inherently difficult for humans to understand because we're so poor at it i mean we do as you say have olfactory communication intra specifically yeah Uh, but we really we really de-emphasize that i mean you know, that's one of the reasons why we have an ocular semit is because we're so poor at smelling each other. Yeah. And um, yeah. impalas are much better at smelling each other, but even they have a problem, as I mentioned, because while they're chewing the cud, they have mm. a sort of a stink, stink factor that you and I can only imagine that fills up their noses. Yeah. And I, I think at that, at that, during those periods of their life, they're probably even worse at smelling predators than we are. So the whole thing is very complicated. And we are straying from the topic of adaptive coloration, but it, at least this, this all illustrates how um, comprehensively you have to think about the whole biology of the animal in order to begin to um, interpret the pattern of its coloration on the various parts yeah. of the anatomy. Absolutely. Uh, we haven't uh, even ventured towards the, the tail and... Um, that I know there, you know, there are many interesting aspects around the tail, and that's perhaps a separate podcast. And also the concept of impala's coloration um, confusing the predator, uh, and that that adaptive strategy. Should we should we perhaps tackle that in a in another uh, part? You know, well, I think we. I think we did cover that to some degree in the last in the last podcast where we explained, you know, that uh, the impala seems to have what I called um, gregarious camouflage. We did actually yes. cover that. But you see, even with the things that we've covered, there's so many aspects of the coloration that remain undocumented and mysterious. Because, at, at, in one sense, an impala is just a plain brown animal, really. Yeah. Uh, uh, at another level of scrutiny, it, it's got so many different small and puzzling and uninterpreted patterns that it would take a whole, whole book just to describe them. When you start yeah. looking at an impala, you know, yeah. impalas are very uniform. There's not much individual variation among them. The male and female are hardly different in coloration. 
and even the newborns are the same as the adults. So in some sense, they're extremely uniform. One of the most uniform yeah. of all ungulates in the sense of not much variation within the species. Um, on the other hand, within each individual, there are so many different subtle patterns of different scales, you know, yeah. a, a sort of a nested system of patterns that um, it's certainly never been described comprehensively in the literature, let alone explained. And there's there's so much to study there um, at the level of pigmentation, uh, hair texture, um, sheen effects, uh, time of day. For example, if you catch impalas early in the morning when it's still cool, you'll notice that the the relatively dark fawn color of the back and upper flanks and rump yeah. is darker because of a certain pilo erection, yeah. presumably to keep warm. Yeah. And so the coloration looks different at that time of the day, but to what effect, I wouldn't know. Um, yeah. There's so many subtle, interesting patterns. But what I think you can say about the Impala is that it does not have a traditional camouflage coat. Yeah. And, and okay. but, but nor, you see, nor does it have the traditional planes game coat because planes game in general have, um, each species has one of the three um, following bold patterns at the level of the whole figure at the scale of the whole figure either yeah. the animal is overall dark so dark that it stands out like a dark object um in the open grassland and a good example of that is is virtually all of the forms of wildebeest they're dark yeah it's not accidental they're, they're meant to stand out from the the golden grassland or even the green grassland they're mm -hmm. meant to be conspicuous to their predators because they rely on gregariousness, not on hiding. Some other species, like for example, the Arabian oryx, um, and even the, the male of the extinct blowbok, um, Hippotragus leucophaeus, they are conspicuously pale. So whether it's dark or pale, kind of the same thing. There are many plains game species that are just overall dark or pale. Mm. And then there are others like the bontobok, for example, which are a combination of stark pale and stark dark in what you might call a piebald or pied pattern. Yeah. And and these animals tend to be so boldly colored at the level of the whole figure um, that hiding uh, camouflage or self-concealment plays no real part in their in their whole um, adaptive strategy. Springbuck would be a good example as well. Springbuck would be an excellent example yeah. as well, except except that, you know, like many species, they do have a hiding stage as newborns. Okay. And at that stage, mainly because of postural reasons, the, the newborn can actually blend into the environment for a while, you know. Okay. Um, but, but when it comes to impalas, they're really fascinating because they don't conform to either the camouflage model or the bold planes game model. There's something right. else. Okay. They're, 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 they're as intricate as the camouflage m model. You know, the, the, yeah. the color is as intricate as that of, say, a kudu or a bushbuck detailed intricate pattern uh, but it's not it's obviously doesn't have the same adaptive value because the animal never stays still and and capitalizes on that camouflage effect yeah um yeah. and and they 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 act like planes game in many ways but they don't have that same bold coloration of the typical planes game animal except in a very limited and sophisticated way by use of the tail which as you said we probably should um go into in a separate podcast because the tail of impalas is much, much more complex and interesting than it may seem. Yeah. It's, it's a unique tail that has never really been fully described anatomically. Okay. And uh, it, it's really worth focusing on. So it's, it, it, it has a coloration in its own category, as it were, and we don't even know what the name of that category should be. Well, it's that, neither bold nor camouflage. That's an excellent way of putting it. Yes, yes, yeah. that's an excellent way of putting it. So we can talk about conspicuous coloration, like a bontebok. A bontebok is like an icon of conspicuous coloration. Yeah. Because no matter whether you're close to it or far from it, like a, two kilometers away, it just stands out like a flag in in the in the on the grassland. You know, mm. everything about it is calculated to be maximally conspicuous. Yeah. Um. Other other animals like uh, well I suppose um, many of the tragolarfins you know the the spotted uh, the, the striped uh, antelopes like the bushbuck or the spotted forms of deer 
they're off, obviously camouflaged. And so in mm. any kind of dappled, partly wooded environment, they tend to blend in. Yeah. So those are obvious groups that we can, or categories that we can give names to. But as you say, with impalas, it's in some other category that we don't have a name for. Yeah. So the, 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 the challenge of interpreting the adaptive coloration of impalas is fundamental to the degree that we don't even have we don't even have a search image for what we're looking at. Yeah. 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 Oh, that's wonderful. A great, a great mystery to go into the Kruger Park with. Um, I'll be taking the kids and uh, the family into the Kruger in a couple of months, and we'll have new lenses for new search images for yes, well, uh, understanding the Impala, yeah. While we're on a roll, uh, I just wanted to mention one thing that visitors to the Kruger Park will have fun spotting. And I know from personal experience how spottable this is, and that is what I call the coronal flag of the Impala, which is unique to, to Impalas. And okay. that is that the, the, um, the fawn-colored fur on the back of the top of the head, on the back of the crown, okay. and on, on the adjacent nape, right at the top of the neck, just yeah. looks fawn in many photographs because it's just got the same medium pigmentation as most of the rest of the animal. Yeah. But very often, and this is more easily seen in the field than in photographs, although you can see it in some photographs. Very often when you look at them in a certain light, you'll see that the, the top of the head, the crown lights up as if it's white. Ah, and that's, okay. that's largely a sheen effect. And it functions as, I, as far as I can see uh, by accentuating the, um, again, it's for vigilance. When the animal has its head down, uh, it's like it's like uh, continual chewing in in a setting of rumination. It's it's like you know all is clear on the western front kind of thing. But yeah. when an animal lifts its head, every other animal in the group wants to know that it's lifted its head because it wants to know uh, its reaction to its scanning of its environment. And so, okay. in impalas, they they have a, a coloration flag on the back of their head that accentuates and assists. The perception of all the group members that this animal's head is up. So it's, ah. it's one thing for the head to come up, and, and that's conspicuous enough because of, of the sensitivity to motion. But yeah. it's like the, the head lights up under certain ah. illumination conditions when the head is is maximally high. And so it's like these okay. series of strobe lights going off. You know, like ah. uh, okay. as each animal raises its head, there's a little puff of light, and and uh, right. and that that assists this this group vigilance, which is so difficult for the human mind to apprehend and and what's particularly interesting about this particular uh feature of coloration the coronal flag is it's almost entirely a specific anatomically restricted sheen that also mm. corresponds to a particular hair whirl because if you look in detail at the pelage on the back of the of the head you'll see a kind of a almost like you know the way water drains into a drain pipe it's a whirl of hair it's not just yeah. ordinary hair as this pattern that must yeah, somehow assist yeah. the sheen so what I would say to, to listeners and viewers is, you know, when you're in the Kruger Park, look out for this coronal flag. It's, it's tremendously rewarding to spot. And you can start spotting it within a few minutes of picking up on any group of, of impalas in decent sunlight. Right. I think it only functions in the light as opposed to the pedal flag, which probably operates in the dark by means of some other kind of sheen. But anyway, putting all these, these uh, details aside, I think at least uh, listeners can get a flavor of how exquisitely sophisticated and um, mysterious, you know, the, uh, the, the details of the adaptive coloration are in an animal that many would simply pass up as being plain colored and, uh, yeah. you know, simply, yeah. simply designed to blend into some nebulous background. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. You know, us humans like to spend hours uh, gazing at paintings like the Mona Lisa that... <laughs> We should be spending days gazing at the impala. It's just truly wondrous. <laughs> well, not just the impala, because, you know, in, in some sense, yeah. all animals, all ungulates no, and all animals have fascinating coloration. But um, I think for me, the main fascination is how different the, the different ungulates are in their coloration. Mm. And I'll just, mm. I'll just leave you with a, a final example, just, you know, in terms of framing. If you go yeah. to the Javanese, the, the Indonesian archipelago, including Java, which was once connected to the mainland of Southeast Asia, but also yeah. the various Indonesian groups of islands, there's only one um, ruminant on those islands. It's called the Javan Rusa deer, 
yeah. um, Rusa Timorensis. It's about in pile of size. You can see it on Bali. If you go to Bali for a holiday, there's a little national park in the northwestern tip of the island, and you can see these uh, Javanese, or you know, Javan Rusa deer there. And what's remarkable about these deer is that they're utterly plain colored. Mm. They, they're so similar uh, physiognomically to an impala that they're perhaps the most impala-like of all the deer in body size and shape, right. uh, you know, apart from the fact that they have antlers and so on. But they are, they're, they're so, so different in terms of just simply being brown. Hmm. Now, an impala's brown and a Javan rusa's brown, but the difference is that a Javan rusa is just plain brown, you know, like the top <laughs> of your table there. Yeah. Whereas the impala is, is brown, is brown in a way that it took a maestro with a with a palette of not only pigments and colors but also sheen effects to mm -hmm. to create its um, intricately crisp and beautiful differentiation, almost like a mosaic work, you know. And so yeah. that fascinates me that animals can be so similar in many ways and yet have such different levels of sophistication and um, uh, complex function in their adaptive coloration. It just has to be a function of predation pressure. Do you think predatory pressure is just so much greater in the African savanna than in the Indonesian forest? I mean, there are yes, tigers and uh, cloud, um, clouded leopards, etc. So I, I certainly, I certainly think that's true. But you see, Anthony, it's not a perfectly satisfactory explanation because in 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 uh, environments in the world where predation is really switched off, like on some islands, um, excluding the Indonesian ones, the animals look as if they are um, safe because they've got short legs, stubby bodies, and so on. The Svalbard yeah. reindeer is a perfect example. If you go to Svalbard, there's a kind of reindeer endemic to those islands, which is downright dwarfed. You know, it's got these stodgy little legs. It obviously mm. doesn't need to run from anything. And the same is true for the puru deer in the southern part of the uh, the Andes in Chile. They really look mm. like predatory animals. They've got these stubby little legs. They've got forward-facing eyes. They just look as if they're 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 used to having a predator-free life. But yeah. the 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 Javan rusa is is not like that. It's it's very impala-like in in its long-leggedness and its body um, shape and so on. And I, and I dare say that it can run very well. Yeah. And on Java, it used to have not only the, the Javanese form of the leopard, but also um, a, a form of tiger at one point. Mm. So, and, and, you know, there's the dole, which is the African hunting dog gone, you know, in Asian form, the Asian equivalent of the African hunting dog. So yeah. uh, you can't really say that the Javanese Russo is, is predator free, and yet it has such a different coloration from both the, the tragalafins like the Bushbuck Nyala Kudu complex and also the Plains Game complex. So mm. what you say, I, I would never pretend to be able to explain adaptive coloration. All I would like to advocate for is a greater interest in it. Yeah. That's all. Yeah, wonderful. Well, I, I'm sure the family is going to enjoy watching Impalas you know, with, with these new lenses on. So thanks very much and uh, look forward to getting into Impala Tales in the, in the next uh, part of this Impala series. Indeed, Anthony, thank you so much. And uh, to listeners, please like, subscribe and share. And we here at the Bio Edge look forward to our next uh, podcast. And until then, over and out from us. <laughs>